Hello, C.B. Phillips here. I'm the owner operator of NBS Welding in Buckhannon, West Virginia. Welcome to the shop. A good buddy of mine, John Kretschmer, who's the vice principal of the Homesdale High School up in Homesdale, Pennsylvania. Uh, he asked me a while ago to do a video on uh, downhill pipe welding. So we're gonna give it a shot. Now the downhill pipe welding, generally the code uh, is the API 1104. Uh, API meaning American Petroleum Institute. Uh, they've written a code for this type of welding that has worked good for a long time. It's uh, full penetration pipe welds, uh, cannot contain any slag, multi-pass with the uh, with the pipe rod, the cellulose based pipe rod, which I've got right here. Uh, these cellulose based pipe rods are completely different than uh, other electrodes like the low hydrogen. The low hydrogen should contain no moisture. You know, your, your 7018 rods, uh, you can keep those in a rod oven and keep the moisture out of them. This cellulose base rod contains moisture and that amount of moisture must be in this. If you put one of these cellulose rods in a rod oven, a heated rod oven, and suck all that moisture out of it, it will not weld worth a hoot. It's very difficult to control uh, and you almost can't weld with it. Uh, won't maintain an arc, hard to control, they just, they, they really go, go bad. Uh, now, one little tip, if, if you have some of these cellulose based pipe rods, your 6010, 7010, 8010G, uh, if they've gotten dried out, generally they'll turn kind of white. You'll see a white looking, almost a white colored uh, blotchiness to them when, they, when they're dried out. If you have some rods that are like that, Something you can try rather than just throwing them away. Uh, you can put moisture back in these rods. Now, I would not weld on a pipeline with three moisturized rods. I wouldn't take a pipe test with them. But for practicing, I'm not saying you're going to fix them and make them like a brand new rod out of a brand new can, but you can improve the way that they'll weld. What you would do if you have dried out pipe rods is you want to get you a... Uh, a clean five gallon bucket and fill it up with water and put your rods right down in that water and slosh them around enough to get them wet and then take them out and lay them on a piece of bar grain for about two days. Uh, after two days you, you can weld with them and, and the moisture that you've put in them by doing that will definitely improve the, the way they weld. So, uh, that's one, one little tip on the electrodes. Uh, your starts and stops and your tacks, you're, you're gonna be using a grinder. It's important that your grinder's got a 1 8 inch wheel uh, made, for, made for pipe because a quarter inch wheel is gonna be too fat. It's gonna mess up your fit. It's gonna dig into your bevels and uh, that would be undesirable. There's a couple other tools I got here. These are uh, spacing wedges, spacing tools that a pipe welder would use uh, during his fit up. Now you'll notice these things if you look at the end of them how sharp they are. They're as sharp as a mother-in-law's tongue and they have to be. Uh, <clears throat> when we're talking about this API code our space between the two pipes we're welding together, you're only talking about like a sixteenth of an inch. So to get these in there and do you any good, they've got to be sharp on the end. Now, these are the kind of welding wedges, spacing wedges that I've bought at a welding supply. Uh, so they're real nice, but uh, you, you could make these homemade. Uh, 
But one tip on that is, I know this looks like a piece of flat bar that's been sharpened. Don't waste your time trying to make a set of spacing wedges out of a mild steel flat bar. Uh, they're not gonna work right. This material, whatever you make spacing wedges out of, if you try to make them homemade, this material needs to be a hard steel. It needs to be harder than the pipe. Uh, now, if you took a piece of, say, two inch or inch and a half uh, by quarter flat bar that was a mild steel, and you shaped it like this with a grinder, and you think, oh, I got me a wedge. If you put that in your pipe, uh, one of the effects when, when we're running a root bead, you know, uh, in any bead really, that pipe is trying to squeeze together. The, the heating up and cooling down of, of welding on it is trying to squeeze it together. That's one of the great things about having some wedges to stick in there to keep that space so that it doesn't close up on you. Now, if you was to shove a piece of mild steel in there and, and, and go to welding on it and it pinches into that soft mild steel with these sharp bevels, you're probably not going to get it out of there anyway. By the time you do beat it out of there, uh, you're liable to have ruined your fit up, your land and your bevel anyway. So that's one thing on these, this material, it, this material these are made out of, it's harder than the law on a bootlegger. It is hard, hard stuff. Now, what you would, if you want to make these homemade, you might uh, get some leaf springs maybe off an old trailer or an old truck, something out of the junkyard or something that, that's not any good for anything else. You know, you, <clears throat> you might have seen leaf springs before, how they're kind of tapered on the end. They won't be sharp enough. You'll have to take an angle grinder and sharpen them more, but if you if you had a leaf spring that was already tapered down some, then you're halfway there. And uh, one note on shaping these, if you make them homemade, you could use a leaf spring, maybe a, an old chisel or some kind of tool steel, something you found, as long as it's hard metal. Uh, when you're shaping it and grinding it, you might wanna grind a little and then cool it with water, and then grind a little and cool it with water, because with this, hardened tempered steel if you go just grinding to beat the band and get this thing hotter than the hubs of Hades then you're going to take the temper out of it and, and then it won't be hard no more and, and that's that's undesirable so uh, anyway fit, fit up spacing wedges are a good thing to have I got some pipe fit up here I'm going to try and show you uh, On this API code, what we got here, we got a 35 degree pipe bevel here. Uh, both our pipes will be beveled equally like that. And we got a 1 16th inch land. That's that flat spot right here at the very end. Uh, take your time doing a good job making that land consistent, making your pipe uh, square so it fits good. You know, if you're out of square, you're gonna have too much gap on one side, not enough gap on the other. Uh, make this land even so it's not thicker and thinner and thicker and thinner around it. Uh, there's a lot of skill in getting a good fit up. And particularly when we're practicing and uh, testing your your fit up is going to help you. The, the better your pipe fit, uh, the easier it is to weld. Now another thing you can do on fit up, uh, you probably can't see it, but I've put a punch mark on this that lines up with a punch mark on my other pipe. Because what I did was, I stuck these together and where they were perfectly square, I rotated it until it fit the best I could get it to fit. And then I put this punch mark on here that I would line up with this other punch mark to tell me that, that that's the way I want it. Because, you know, if, it, if I have it a different way, it doesn't fit as good. So uh, if you're taking a test or something, don't punch the pipe like I punched it with a center punch like this. You would use a piece of soapstone for that. I knew I was going to be handling this, and I figured I'd wipe the soapstone off 
So I, I used a punch mark, but that's gonna be fine for what we're doing now. This is another thing that uh, we would use to set space. This is a 1 16th inch TIG rod that's, uh, I think when these come, they're 36 inches long. You, you bend this into a V and you can use it. See, I can set that right here like this and I can line my other pipe up and I can get me a tack right here and this, this rod is holding my space. And uh, one note on that is once you've got one tack, you need to get this TIG rod out of there. Spread the other side open, pull the TIG rod out. If you put your TIG rod in there and you tack it here and then you come over here and you tack the other side, you're gonna have a heck of a time trying to get that rod out of there. Because like we said, you know, you weld on the pipe, it tries to squish together on you. And, and, and this is a mild steel rod, so once you squash it in there, you might not be able to get it out. So it's a good idea to get that out after your first tack. Uh, generally on these coupons that you're making up when you're welding or, or testing or whatever, uh, you would have four tacks. You, you make a tack, then another tack straight across from that tack and then, uh, you know, two more tacks here, left and right, and, and with the equal distances between them. Uh, this six inch 250 wall that I've got here, I may just do two tacks and then wedge uh, to eliminate two extra tacks. So that's something you can do if you have a wedge handy. Uh, Now, this type of welding, the downhill pipe welding, uh, this is how cross country natural gas and oil pipelines are, are welded and uh, the piping and plumbing at natural gas compressor stations. And, and there is a lot of work in the Appalachian Basin for this type of work. It's a good thing to get into if you like welding. Uh, it is hard to learn. It's kind of an advanced thing. I think there's different things that make it hard to learn. Uh, it happens really fast. And since it, it, it's a fast process, uh, you kind of got to have it together. Uh, you can make a mistake on this in a quarter of a second. It'll take you 15 minutes to fix. And you know, most of the pipe tests that you're gonna to take to get on a pipeline, they're only gonna give you so much time. Now, if you make mistakes, you can fix those mistakes by use of a grinder, uh, you know. You, you can fix something in your, uh, if there's a, a small flaw in your root bead, you can fix that in your hot pass, uh, if it's small. And, and you know, you can make repairs, but if it takes you too long, if, if you're not practiced up and you know, you have a, a problem, uh, it could it cause you to lose your test. Now, the passes on this code, we're gonna have a root bead, a hot pass, a filler, and a cap. And there's always a root bead, a hot pass, and a cap. Now, the thicker the pipe is, the more fillers you're gonna have. Uh, this is just probably like 250 wall or something. This isn't very heavy of a pipe. Uh, but talking about the root bead, you know, we're gonna work hard to get an even land and an even space. Uh, going right at 1 16th of an inch. Something you can remember about that is space and land go hand in hand. When you have 1 16th inch of land, you're gonna want 1 16th inch of space. When you're running the, the smaller rods, this is a 1 8th. Uh, with a 332, you might like a little bit less uh, land and space. With a 532, you might like a little bit more. I, I tend to say, for a 532nd rod, a, a penny. The thickness of a penny. A penny land and a penny space. Uh, for a 332nd rod, which is the one smaller than the 1 8th, 
uh, I would say a dime, the thickness of a dime, a dime land, dime space. Uh, so we start out with a root bead once we're tacked up. Uh, now, on a root bead, one of the things that we, uh, we can do to control our, our root bead is how, uh, how we manipulate rod angle. Rod angle and travel speed. Now, if your lands were perfect, your space was perfect, and everything in the world was perfect, and all the planets were in perfect alignment, then you could point your rod straight at this pipe, maintain that, pointing straight at the center of this pipe, and run a perfect root bead all the way around this pipe every single time. Uh, Odds are you're going to be a few amps off. Odds are you're going to have places that are a little bit inconsistent. <clears throat> so one of the things we can do with rod manipulation is change our rod angle. Now, what we're trying to do when we run a root bead is we're trying to completely melt both of these lands together, adding the filler from our rod, and see that material and that molten puddle fused together behind us as we travel. Now the hole that you're going to see as you're doing this, I call that a keyhole, uh, your keyhole is going to be following behind your arc as you burn around here. Now with rod manipulation, with rod angle, if you're welding along here and that keyhole is getting bigger, meaning it's following further behind, almost so far behind that you're not getting the fusion. <clears throat> what you can do is you want to lay this rod angle down a little bit and drag it. Point the tip of the rod towards where you're coming from and drag it. Uh, that's going to happen a lot on the top. You know, you, you'll start out here and that keyhole's getting too big on the top. Gravity's fighting against you trying to pull that molten puddle downward too much. Uh, so you might lay your rod down a little bit. Now when you get down here on the side, gravity's fighting you again, and you might have a hard time getting through and getting that, maintaining that keyhole. So you're going to want to angle that rod towards the center of the pipe again. When the keyhole gets bigger, lay the rod down. If the keyhole's getting smaller, raise that angle and point it towards the center of that pipe so you can get through. Uh, if your amperage is way too high, you're probably going to have to stop and turn it down. Uh, if your amperage is way too low, you're going to have to stop and turn it up. Uh, if your space is too tight, you might have to stop and use your grinder to do what I'd call soften it up. You might have to use your grinder to remove some steel, some material, uh, so that you can get that arc through there and, and get a keyhole. Now, your starts and stops and tacks are going to have a heavy place where you started and a keyhole where you stopped. Now, you don't need to grind the keyhole where you stopped a whole lot. The heavy, uh, the heavy start of a tack, you need to grind that uh, kind of like in the shape of a ramp. Uh, you want to grind that heavy starting area down to where you know that when you go back and you light up an arc on that tack and, and you come into it, you want to know that uh, you can reach in there and get the fusion between those lands. So uh, you're going to travel around there and put in a root bead. Now, when you put in a root bead and you got your root bead in there right, there's gonna be a humped up bead in the center. And some undercuts called wagon tracks on each side of that bead. Uh, now, we always grind the root bead. You take your grinding wheel, you grind your root bead. The amount that you grind out of your root bead, there is a little bit of controversy here or there depending on who you're dealing with, who you're working for. Uh, now, I know welders that uh, when it comes to grinding their root bead, they'll take their grinder and they'll grind into there 
and they'll go in there and they'll grind that until they got nothing but pure steel. They'll grind their wagon tracks all the way out until they're gone before they run their hot pass. Now, I can tell you when I tested 1104 code for Columbia Natural Gas, they would not allow me to grind my wagon tracks all the way out. I was allowed to use a grinder, but only to flatten the humped up center of that root beef. I had to burn the wagon tracks out on the hot pass. So that's just something where you're gonna have to deal with uh, whoever you're working for. Uh, so you'll have to decide if it's left up to you how much to grind it. Uh, you'll have to decide how you wanna do that. Now I can tell you, after you run your root bead, when you go to run your hot pass, you're always going to turn your machine up. Uh, almost always going to turn the heat up. Now, if you grind your root bead to the point that all your wagon tracks are completely gone, you're not going to want to turn your machine up as much as what you would turn it up if you were only allowed to grind the center of your root bead and flatten the hump. Uh, when you flatten the hump and don't go any further, you're leaving a lot more steel in there to run your hot pass on, so that's going to take more heat. Now, if you ask me how much do I want to grind my root bead, I can tell you in the 5G position, if you're going to trap slag, if you have slag entrapment in the 5G position, most generally it's going to be at the top. It's a lot easier to burn out slag on the bottom. You're down here welding on the bottom and heat's rising. That heat arc force is rising up into that pipe. If you got some slag in the bottom, odds are down here on the bottom you can burn that slag out. Now it's easier to fill material up here on the top. It's harder to fill down here on the bottom. So. If you ask me how am I going to grind my root bead in a 5G position like this, I'm going to grind more out of the top than what I would grind out of the bottom. And I do that knowing that if I grind a little more out of the top, that's just, it's the top. So it's that much easier that I could add extra fill up here on my next pass. Now, the root bead is a, so, or a I'm excuse, excuse me, uh, the hot pass, uh, what most people do is a bit of a, a little bit of a rod angle down like a drag and a scratching motion. Maintaining a short arc, staying down here onto that root bead. You don't want to go filling up these bevels on the hot pass. On the hot pass, you're staying down deep. And, and that's how it is with all these consecutive passes. Your hot pass is going to be a little bit wider than your root bead. Your fill pass is going to be a little bit wider than your hot pass. And then your cap is going to come out here to the edge of your bevel and fill. Now, as you do this scratching motion, I mean, I guess for me, I, I'm thinking of it kind of a scratch and a pause. Scratch, pause, scratch, pause, scratch, pause. But uh, you're kind of pressing on that root bead, making sure... Uh, that there's no weak spots in it. Uh, if there is a weak spot in it, you may blow through it for just a second. Uh, don't freak out if you did that because you probably just fixed something. Now, one of the things that's hard about this downhill pipe is these positions are constantly changing and the pipe's gonna behave different uh, as you go. Now, when you get down here on the bottom, you might end up just kind of stepping out of it. Uh, that pipe wants to get real hot. When you're down here on the bottom, uh, it's really hard to fill, it's really hot, and you might have to step out a little and let your puddle freeze and come back to the puddle. A bit of a motion like that. Uh, you want your hot pass to either be flat or concave in shape. You should not have a humped up center in your hot pass uh, like you would have when you run a root bead. 
Uh, if you do have a humped up center in your hot pass and, and you try and fill over that, the slag and the undercuts on the left and the right of that, uh, that's giving you a place where you could trap slag. So if you have a humped up place in your hot pass, you're going to want to take a grinder and flatten that out. Uh, and try to run your hot pass so that it's either concave or flat. Now, after we get the hot pass in there, power brush it, maybe grind a little out of the top. I like to grind a little out of the top if, if, they're, if, if it's up to me and they're gonna let me. Uh, it's easier for me to fill on top, so I'm gonna grind a little bit on the hot pass on the top. And uh, when it's time to fill, I wanna fill that I want to fill that pipe as full as I can get it without damaging this edge, this edge of this bevel. You do not want to touch that edge of that bevel until you fill it or until you cap it. Uh, so your filler pass is going to fill your pipe all the way up and leave this edge alone. By leaving the edge of that bevel alone, uh, you're going to have a nice straight line to tell you on your cap uh, where to cap it. So that's kind of the idea on the filler pass. Now on the cap, uh, oftentimes I like to go up one size in electrode. So this this pipe here I might cap with a 532nd rod, a little bit bigger. Uh, Five feet plus. Now, that's pretty common. Uh, if I was welding two inch pipe, uh, say schedule 40 or whatever, I would run a root bead, a hot pass, and a filler with a 332nd, and then I would cap it with one eighth. If you had some big pipe, you know, uh, 380 wall, 10 inch, 16 inch, 12 inch, something like that. Uh, I'd run a root bead, a hot pass, and a filler with a 532nd rod, and then I would cap it with a 316th. So uh, it, it, it's common to uh, go up one size in electrode on the cap. Let's line this up. And See if we can get a tack on it. I'm thinking of welding this out in uh, 5G position, which that's when we're going to have our pipe horizontal. Uh, it's funny, you know, during most uh, most weld tests, they're going to have you uh, on a pipe test. They're going to have you weld it in 6G, which is your pipe's going to be at 45. To me, 6G is easier than 5G. Uh, but 6G is the position that certifies you forever. You know, on tacking these up, when you make a tack, you're going to get a little bit of an indication of where your heat's at for your hot pass. So pay attention while you tack. Making your tack is just like running your root bead. So if you're way too hot or cold, you might be able to find out right now.
one side is going to be tighter than the other, and that's where the wedge comes in. This is kind of like I thought. That wedge is in there so tight, I'm not going to take it out right now. What I would do is I would start on this top tack, running my root beat down in this 5G position, and when I get down to the wedge, I'll take it out. Uh, another thing you could do would be to uh, use four tacks, have a tack here, and then another one straight across there, but your tacks always should be straight across from the, one another. Uh, so I'm going to put this in the fixture uh, and get it in the 5G position. vibrations from that grinder cause the wedge to fall out and I'll take care of that. Another thing I'm thinking of right now these uh these foam earplugs generally we think of these as being something that gives you hearing protection from sound from the noise of grinding or what not. Uh, when I was welding, uh, when I was uh, welding pipe for Columbia Natural Gas, they actually had one of their pipe welders. He got a hot, hot ball in his ear, which is common because you're turning your head sideways a lot. Uh, that hot ball was hot enough and big enough that it went all the way into his ear, into his eardrum, and burned his eardrum to where it destroyed his hearing in that ear. The doctors weren't able to help him or do anything about it, so he was actually deaf in one. He's actually deaf in one ear now, forever. Uh, these foam earplugs will help with that. Uh, like I say, we generally think of them as being something that protects our ears from sound, but if a hot ball hits that foam earplug, it'll melt into that earplug and usually cool off and just get stuck in there, 
So these are a good idea uh, anytime you're welding to keep that, keep those hot balls out of your ears. Jump that far. We'll need one of these.
I've turned the machine up to about pass. Weak spot there at the very top of that pipe I had to pick. Weak spot to repeat.
machine down a little bit for the filler pad.
about 30 seconds. Rod, the cap.
Now we got that welded and cleaned up, so I'll cut it out so we can take a look at it and see how bad a bugger it up.
show you the ugly old bottom first. You can see there's some spots here where I grinded. Right here, right here. Now, on the API code, there should not be more than 1 16th of an inch sticking up past the plane of this pipe right here. So if you got more than a 16th, that should be ground off. There's the ugly bottom. Right here we'd be at the top. You can see my center punch mark there where I started at the top. There's the bottom. Now, if I turn it this way, you can see the bead on the inside. You want to make sure that you shouldn't have any places where you can see those straight lands. They should be melted completely off. I see some mild undercut in there. Don't really see any IP or insufficient penetration. Right here at the top where I had that problem. That spot might be a little heavy. So it's not perfect. You might have seen there at last where I ran a file across the edges. Every weld has an undercut on the sides. You can run a file on each side of your bead to straighten that up. So I hope the video helps. Uh, I'm certainly not the best pipe welder there ever was, but it should at least be able to give you an idea of what you can work on, maybe get you, get you going, maybe something that someone else forgot to tell you or whatever. Uh, hope the video turns out okay. Uh, I'm certainly no cameraman and welding is a diff difficult thing to try to video anyway, but I appreciate you watching and uh, Good luck with it.